You're listening to an AINC original podcast. We believe you don't have to do life without a compass. Let us be your guide on this amazing journey. Welcome to Navigating Life with Vision Loss. Hello, I'm Kim Wardlow, your host, and welcome to Navigating Life with Vision Loss. We are back this week talking about travel and specifically going on a cruise. Last week, we talked with Sue Slater, and she gave us some great tips on travel in general and traveling with vision loss or blindness. Sue, was there anything that you wanted to add? Um, well, thank you for joining us again, but is there anything that you would like to add that that we uh, didn't get to last week or uh, maybe forgot to mention last week? Yes, I wanted to let the people know that when they're looking at going to places in the United States, they should also look at smaller cities, places like Bentonville, Arkansas, Little Rock, Arkansas, and Springfield, Illinois, have wonderful opportunities for the visually impaired as far as what they're allowed to touch in museums, what the audio description is, and educators whose only job is to do tours for the visually impaired. Great. That's good to know. I think smaller cities often get overlooked. You know, we're all going right. to New York or LA or the the big places. So uh, smaller cities can be great and, and sometimes not so crowded too, which can be nice. Right. I want to remind everybody, if you would like um, to contact Sue to help book your next vacation, you can visit her at prestomagictravel.com. Um, you can email her through that site as well. Also, if you have other travel questions that you would like us to get answers for you, um, you can get those questions to us by either calling um, our our feedback line at 720-712-8856 and leaving a voicemail with your question. Or if, uh, if you would prefer to use email, you can do that. You can email us at feedback at aftersight.org. And I'm excited that we actually do have a few questions um, from listeners who were, who were listening last week, and they had some questions about cruises, which coincidentally enough, um, you're familiar with. Yes, I am. And, and, it, and in fact, is one of your, is one of your specialty areas. Um, how many cruises have you been on? 41 cruises and counting. <laughs> oh, my goodness. And and all the different all different places, right um, from Alaska all over the world? to Turkey. Wow, that's a lot of cruising. Well, our first question actually uh, talks about an Alaskan cruise. Um, John is asking is is saying I just booked an Alaskan cruise for the end of August. What do I need to pack? And what are some things to watch out for when cruising? As this is my first time on a ship love to talk about it. So Alaska in August is warm. It may be warmer than what it is in the city where they come from. The only time it's going to be really cold in August is when they're either walking across a glacier or sailing by the different glaciers. Otherwise, it's going to be warm when they're touring outside. And if it's their first time traveling, they need to know that what's included in the cruise and what's not included in the cruise. So basically, all of the food, all of the basic entertainment, and your base cruise price, government fees and taxes, pre-gratuities, our tips, and travel insurance will be included in the price that you pay. Then there's extras, and depending on a person's budget and what they want to experience while on the ship, they can do the all-included program, which includes the unlimited drinks and the unlimited Wi-Fi and specialty dining, or they can choose to go ahead and do a roller coaster or race car experience or ice skating or things like that that depending on the cruise ship, 
might be extra. The biggest thing they're going to have to worry about when they're on a cruise is their activities because there is always three activities going on at the same time that you want to do and you're going to have to choose. Um, When packing, I recommend that you decide what outfits you want to wear, put them in individual garment bags like trash bags, uh, bring different types of Ziploc bags along because they're amazing to use for everything. If you're a woman, to put your jewelry in, to put your swimming suits in, to go up to the buffet and bring back food in. I also bring some styrofoam cups with me, some styrofoam bowls with me, just to put things in to have in my room if I want to. They need to know that when they get on the ship to bring a carry-on bag with them that includes essentials they cannot be parted with, such as medicines, a change of clothes, a swimming suit, until their luggage is brought back to the room. If you're Mm -hmm. visually impaired, there's a special line you can get into where they streamline the booking. And when you get onto the ship, the steward will show you where your room is. And basically on a ship, there's three main decks usually. The deck where all the services are and the lounges and bars and restaurants. The deck where the theater is. And then the upper deck where the buffet is, the pools, and the hot tubs are. And basically, once you learn how to navigate those three decks, you're in pretty good shape. And if somebody sees you look lost, they'll say, can I help you? Because sighted people get lost on cruise ships, not just people that are visually (laughs) impaired. Especially some of the large ones, I would imagine. Oh, yeah. the easy to get get lost. Yeah. (laughs) Exactly. There's like 7,000 passengers now. So you're like traveling with a city, (laughs) not just a village. Would you recommend for someone where it's their first time cruising and they get on the ship, do do they just start exploring or or, uh, is there kind of like a concierge at a hotel where you could go and and ask, is there somebody who could take you on a tour of the ship? But the cool thing is, is that (laughs) now... Certain cruise ships have what's known as audio describers, and I've experienced them three times now. An audio describer is a person that the ship will fly and put on the cruise ship with you, and they will give you eight hours a day. And during that eight hours, they can help you explore the ship. They can do live audio description with you at one of the shows. They're allowed to go on the tours with you. They can take pictures for you, videos for you, describe things, guide you as you go on and off the bus to where the tour's going, things like that. And it makes life much easier for somebody who's visually impaired. It needs to be requested when the cruise is booked and it's done on an individual basis. Okay. Well, I didn't know that that was a service that they offered if you if you booked that in advance. That's that's a huge advantage especially if you're traveling alone. Right, exactly. And also um ships now have apps to where you can go on and look at the different activities for the day, see what deck it's going to be on, what time it's going to be on, which makes it quite easy for someone to know what's going on. They also will provide you with large print um, newspapers and they will also provide you with braille newspapers sometimes depending on the ship. And if you don't bring your laptop with you, a lot of the ships now will have a designated laptop or desktop in their internet cafe that has JAWS on it. But again, it depends on the ship and it depends on the cruise line. Are there are there cruise lines that you found have more accessibility than others? Again, it just depends on the ship. Because even if it's the same cruise line, one ship might have better services than another ship does. And it changes from year to year. 
So it's really hard to say which ship or cruise line is the best. Princess is very good about doing things with accessibility. Royal Caribbean is also very good about doing things with accessibility. They have accessibility specialists that are great. So I was just going to ask about different types of cruises or kinds of cruises. I know like there's general categories like ocean cruises and river cruises, but then I've also seen, you know, it, when they advertise cruises, ones that are more family oriented, ones that are more um, adults. I even had a friend whose father and his wife went on a cruise that uh, they were actually doing some scientific experiments. It was it was a more hands-on experiential adventure type cruise. Right. So there is different types of cruises. Royal Caribbean and Carnival are and Norwegian cruise lines are more family oriented. Uh, Viking, Virgin, Princess, Howlin' America, Celebrity, Oceana is more adult oriented, even though there's, you know, kids on some of these cruise lines on the river cruises there's usually no children big people are 18 and older on virgin cruise lines the people are 18 and older and it's just adults only and the thing about the cruise ships that even if there's children on them on the more upscale ones the children's programs are so great that you never even see the kids it's not like you have kids running around, making a racket, and being chaotic and everything. So just like there's activities for adults, they have lots of activities for the kids at the same time. Right. And and there's cruise lines that, again, that just cater to, like, National Geographic cruises, things like that, where they do the mm-hmm. scientific experiments, or they go to the Antarctic, or they go to Iceland. And that's different than the main cruise lines with all the bells and whistles, the river cruises that are more adult oriented are different than the main cruise lines because they're slower. They go up and down the rivers, they overnight in different places, and they allow you to get into the villages and the cities where when you're on main cruise ships, if you're going to a certain place, they usually have like a 12 to 14 hour itinerary to be in that port because it may take an hour and a half or two hours to get from where the ship docks to say to Rome or to Naples. And so you need to know that even if you're in a certain country and you're docking by the ocean, where you want to go may not be like right next to that ocean. Oh, okay. So there may be excursions that are actually not just a couple a few hours, a few hours of getting off the boat and coming back on the boat if you're actually needing to travel to a different city. Right. So, like, for example, if you're going to Rome and you want to see the Vatican and the Colosseum and you want to see the different museums, you dock in by the ocean, but to get into Rome is a two-hour drive each way. Mm -hmm. So once you get into Rome, you can navigate on your own or you can do tours. But to know that it's going to be a four-hour travel time just to get from where you dock to where you want to go to sightsee. Okay, that's a really really important tip (laughs) and thing to know. And and I didn't know that until I did my first cruise in Europe. (laughs) That that makes a huge difference if you have to calculate in that travel time. Exactly. So when you're planning tours, as long as you know that, that's great. If you do a tour with a cruise company, they'll make sure that you get back on time. If you're comfortable and have cruised before or have traveled before and you want to do it on your own, you can go ahead and arrange that with other tour companies that work with the cruise itineraries and times. Just know to allow extra time for traffic because, as I've seen, the ship will leave you if you miss it. <laughs> <laughs> you may yes. have an extended stay in a particular port. <laughs> right. We, we, we were on one, one ship and was doing New England. And we were in Boston, and the next 
um, port was Martha's Vineyard. And we had dinner with a lady that night in Martha's Vineyard who told us that she met her friends for lunch in Boston. And she didn't look at the time. And by the time she got back to the Navy yard where the ship was going out of, it was gone. Oh, no. Luckily, the next port was only Martha's Vineyard. Right, so she could travel there. Yeah, and she was able to get a ferry to travel there. But if you miss the ship in in Italy and the next port is Turkey, (laughs) you may not be able to do so so easily. Yeah, it's a little trickier. Yes. Well, I'm talking about timing. Um, There are are cruises of different lengths, and especially for the first-time cruise traveler, is there a, a length of cruise that you would recommend? Because I know um, I had friends that you know were doing a world cruise, and they were going to be gone. I don't know, two months or something. <laughs> but um, but there's obviously there are shorter cruises. Uh, even in the U.S., you can do fall color cruises and things like that. Is do you have recommendations for somebody who's going on a cruise for the first time? Yes, I do. I would not do anything less than a five-night cruise because it takes you at least a day to get used to the ship and the last night you're packing to get off. So if you do a three-night cruise, it really doesn't give you time to enjoy it. Mm -hmm. So a five- to seven-night cruise is the shortest length of time that I would do. I myself like longer cruises, but for a first-time cruiser that wants to see if they like cruising, A five-night cruise where they go to at least two ports or a seven-night cruise where they're going to three or four different places is what I recommend. Okay. That kind of gives them a taste, but if for some reason they find that it's not uh, uh, something that that they they want to do frequently, um, they won't won't be stuck on a two- or three-week cruise. Right. And... People on a cruise should have fun because <laughs> you're never going to yes. see those people again. So I've taken ukulele lessons. <laughs> I've lined, I've line danced. <laughs> and I, I did, this is great. I did a Panama Canal cruise two years ago and there was a bean toss contest. And I told my cousin I wanted to do the bean toss, right? So we get up there and they needed a person to do one of the different rounds. So she says, go ahead, Susie. So she, I went up there and she told the cruise director that I needed a handicap because I was blind, okay? So picture this, I'm tossing the bean bag. And as I'm tossing the bean bag, the poor cruise director is running back and forth trying to get the hole to where my bean bag's gonna get in it. Oh no. <laughs> and I got a consolation prize, but All through the cruise, you would not believe how many people came up and told me how much they enjoyed my making a fool of myself. (laughs) And, And this one guy came up to me, and he was like, 15. And he says to me, I want to be like you when I grow up. (laughs) (laughs) So yeah, do the karaoke, you know, participate, have fun. That's good advice because I think sometimes we we hesitate, uh, you know, if they ask for audience participation or something, if you're at a show on the boat or something like that. But, but that's the Go time to it. do it. <laughs> um, you've I talked a little bit about shore excursions. Is there anything else you want to add about um, choosing shore excursions or the best way to, to experience different places through the excursions? So, again... All I can say is make sure that the person that's giving you the tour will be okay with giving you extra description. And if they can provide an audio descriptor for you, take advantage of it. Great. Because that will really help and make things easier for you. Yeah, definitely. So we have another... Oh, go ahead. And have people take lots of pictures and videos for you because with Be My Eyes AI, you can go back and look at those pictures and it will describe the museum you're in, the glass sculpture you looked at, things like that. And it really, really cement those memories and experiences you had while traveling. That is wonderful advice. I hadn't even thought about that, to be able to, to save those memories and just use the technology to describe your photos. So we have another question um, from Samantha. 
who asks, when I'm on a cruise ship with a guide dog, how can I let my guide dog relieve themselves? And can you explain accommodations and accessibility on a cruise ship? Yes. So what they have on a cruise ship is called the poop deck. And the person in guest services will be able to show the person that's visually impaired and their dog the deck and the part of the deck where that is. They have sandboxes for the people to take their dogs. Mm -hmm. And, of course, you need to bring your food for the dog, your poop bags for the dog, your, like, pads, you know, anything that your dog would use or you would use for the dog at home, you need to bring with you on the ship. And you need to bring a crate with you because there might be a port where you're not allowed to bring the dog outside and you have to leave the dog in your cabin. So, of course, you wouldn't want to leave the dog by itself and you would want to leave the dog inside a crate for the time that you would be gone. And not have the dog with you. Right. And that is something good to note, that depending where you're traveling, that you may not be allowed to take your dog on an excursion. And you would know that before you left because of the research that would be done by the travel agent that you worked with, by the vet that you had your dog with. Knowing ahead of time what ports could be taken out with the dog, what ports you would have to leave your dog inside the stateroom. Okay, good to know, and and a good reminder to to bring everything you need for your for your dog. Um, that they won't have all those things on the ship for you. <laughs> exactly. So bring an extra suitcase for the dog. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it needs its own carry on. <laughs> exactly. Uh, can you talk a little bit about getting to and from your departure port? Because most of us uh, you don't live in the city where our crews will be departing. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, I always recommend, and I do this myself, that a person, whether they're sighted or visually impaired, come in at least one day early to the city where the ship is going to be going out of and to get a hotel near the cruise port. And what I do when I fly and I get into the city. So if I'm going to a cruise out of Fort Lauderdale and I fly from St. Louis into Fort Lauderdale and then I have the person that helps me get my luggage find either the lift station or the cab station and take that cab or lift to the hotel. On the morning that the cruise is departing, I again will take a lift or a cab to the port. Once the cab or lift gets there, the people at the port will tell them where to go to leave off their passengers. There'll be somebody from the cruise ship to look at your name, to put tags on your luggage, and to guide you to the line where you check in. A lot of check-in now is done online on an app on your phone, and it makes it very, very sharp Mm. to get from the cruise line in the port up into the cruise ship and onto the ship. And when I get off the ship, whatever city that it gets off in, I will reverse and do the same thing. Once I go down into the terminal and I have somebody help me find my luggage, I have them help me find a cab or show me where to wait for a lift to get me back to the airport and get back to the through security and onto the plane. Okay. That's good tips there because there's more to, you have to get to the ship and and get back home after, after you get off the (laughs) ship. So that's all part of the travel. There's so much information to cover on this topic. Um, So can you tell us a little bit about Presto Magic Travel and folks want to contact you and and have assistance um, from you, what your company offers when you're helping book vacations? Right. Um, I charge a service fee of $100 to do all the research and put everything together. And I talk to them, 
find out exactly what they're looking for. One of the biggest things in being an expert travel agent is listening (laughs) and is listening to what they want, finding out what their travel experiences have been, what type of vacations they've been on in the past or want to go on, what's on their bucket list, what their budget is, because depending on their budget depends on the kind of trip they can do, whether it can be three days, our seven-day land tour, our five-night cruise, our seven-night cruise, because sometimes the biggest part of the cost of your trip is the transportation, Mm -hmm. is air flights, the train tickets, getting there, things like that. So I do it on a case-by-case basis, and I do individuals, and I do groups if they have people that are going to go with them to help them on the ship. Same way with land tours, with national park tours. So this is the kind of thing that I do. I work with everybody on a case-by-case basis because everybody is individual. Everybody has a different kind of visual impairment, what they're comfortable with, what they're not comfortable with, if they travel by themselves, if they always travel with somebody different kinds of things like that. Once I know where they're going to go, I help them find the right cruise ship for the experience that they want, the places that they want to see. I help them look at museums, the kind of tours that they are, walk them through how to do things online, show them what the apps can do if they have them on their phone, tell them what apps they should put on their phone, (laughs) all kinds of things like that. There's a lot of stages and steps to make a trip seamless, fun, with no surprises. Great. Well, thank you, Sue. Do you have a favorite cruise that you've been on or a cruise that you're, Uh, you're still longing to take? Oh, well, my bucket list is Australia and New Zealand. Okay. With a combination of a land and cruise. And I need a month to do it because you need at least a month to do something like that. Yeah experience it the right way. I'm also looking to do a cruise of the UK, London, Wales, Scotland, those places I haven't been before. Well, great. Well, there's always something new to see and a new place to go. So thank you, Sue, for being with us for these two episodes and talking about travel and providing information um, to our listeners. You can, if you have other questions that weren't answered, um, you can get those to us and we can get them to Sue or um, someone else um, who can help you with those. Uh, Feel free to call us at 720-712-8856 or email us at feedback at aftersight.org. If if you've wanted to come to Colorado uh, to see Colorful Colorado, um, you can join us this summer on July 27th, which is going to be our audio trekker hike um, again here in in Boulder County in the Boulder area uh, in the mountains. Um, so, and we do provide sighted guides. You can request a sighted guide uh, if if you're um, not traveling with somebody who would who would be your guide. Uh, it's a great experience, and we have hikers of all abilities. So, um, don't hesitate if if you haven't been um, on a hike or, or many hikes. Uh, We try to make this accessible for for all abilities. So feel free to join us. Um, We will continue on this month of April talking about travel and various aspects of travel. So please continue to join us um, this month for our episodes. I hope the information we provided you so far on travel has helped you navigate your life with vision loss. 